In today's video we will discuss the top 10 saved by the bell episodes. Please make sure you subscribe to the top 10 jaw dropping facts channel. New episodes are released Monday through Friday. Number 10. Dancing to the Max, Season 1, Episode 1. Episodes from the first couple of seasons are generally a bit more difficult to watch than those from the latter half of the show's run. The cheese factor is noticeably higher, the pacing often feels off, and although the cast were never exactly superstar actors, they're especially awkward in their younger years. All of this is true of the very first broadcast, although not actually the first produced, episode, in which the gang enter a dancing competition hosted by Casey Kasem, playing himself. In fact, the dancing scenes themselves might be among the most rancidly cheesy the show would ever produce. But then Screech and Lisa do the sprain, and all of a sudden, everything becomes rather lovely for a couple of minutes. Number 9. The Fight, Season 4, Episode 1. It's hard to fathom why Zack and Slater ever really become friends in the first place. Zack may be annoyingly smug, arrogant and slick, but at least he has his good side. Slater is basically just a monumental you-know-what-to-him throughout the course of the show's four seasons. In the fight, the simmering tension of this unlikely and often fraught bromance comes to the fore, as both chaps find themselves courting the same girl. Oddly, despite this having happened frequently over the previous three years, this episode sees them come to blows for the first time in an argument-turned-brawl so monumentally epic, in its cheesiness that it defies description. We don't think it was meant this way, but it's genuinely one of the funniest moments in the show's history. Number 8. The Wicked Stepbrother, Season 3, Episodes 13 and 14. Episodes centering on Elizabeth Berkeley's aka Jessie tended to be rare in the Saved by Bell universe, and while we contemplated including the infamous caffeine pill addiction antics of Jessie's song in this list, it's an episode that just veers right through so bad it's good and into so bad it's really, really bad. Instead, this third season two-parter introduced us to Jessie's, well, wicked stepbrother, Eric, performing the classic trick of bringing a character into an established group and having them immediately puncture every one of their conventions. Eric is, not to put too fine a point on it, a scumbag, but he's the kind of scumbag you can't help but admire for basically doing whatever he wants and irritating the heck out of the Bayside regulars. Number 7. Save the Max, Season 2, Episode 3. After the Max goes into money trouble the gang finds a way to save the Max with their radio show. Zack and Screech discover the room where Bayside High's radio station, KKTY, was housed. The gang begs to put the station back on air, which had been shut down due to the antics of Richard the Big Bopper Belding when he was a student. With Lisa as the local gossip, Screech telling creepy stories, Zack as the main DJ, Jesse reporting the latest news, Kelly hosting Desire Hour and AC giving sports, the station is such a success, aside from sports, the gang uses the airwaves to save the Max from closing. AC comes in near the end of the telethon to save the day. Number 6. The Malibu Sands Episodes, Season 3. This bizarre half-season was filmed as a block, and actually set immediately following the end of the third season school year. However, in one of the many broadcasting quirks that plagued Saved by the Bell over the years, including some episodes getting their first showing fully two years after being shot. The episodes were interspersed among ordinary installments, meaning that viewers would alternate between seeing episodes set at Bayside, and ones featuring the gang at their summer job at the Malibu Sands Club. Chopped out and grouped together, however, the Malibu Sands episodes hold up fairly strongly. It's difficult to pick out one, since they all kind of merge into one another to form a longer story, but it was good to see the series trying something a bit different and in deliberately putting the characters in an older environment. It feels like a trial run for the later, and very short-lived, primetime spin-off The College Years. It also helps that Leah Ramini's aka Stacy is a welcome change from Zack's usual love interests, plus it also helps that they have a strong on-screen chemistry. Of course, if there's a downside to these episodes, it's in the complete and total lack of Mr. Belding, with bumbling resort manager Leon Carosi serving as a startlingly poor imitation. Number 5. Cut Day, Season 3, Episode 23. A fun episode, built around unusually, a pretty strong central premise. Well, at least once you get past the bizarre notion of an annual, agreed-upon cut day where every student agrees to skip for the day and the school goes along with it. 
On this particular day however, Zack already has too many unauthorized absences so far, and so Belding determines that if he's caught skipping, he'll face a suspension. So of course, the sensible thing our hero does is to make a bet with Slater that he can meet the gang at each of their locations that day. From the max, to the cinema, to a very obviously indoor-looking beach set. The results play out in classic sitcom style, the episode also deserves credit for finally driving a wedge in the ridiculous slater slash jesse relationship. Number 4. The Last Dance, Season 3, Episode 1. The episode that broke a million hearts. Well, maybe a thousand. Well, several at least. Anyway, following the typical 90s sitcom outline will they, won't they pattern, teasing in the first season, on in the second, off again in the third. Season 3 kicked off by suddenly, dramatically breaking up the golden couple of Zack and Kelly. For many youngsters, this would be their first taste of the true heartbreak caused by the death of young love, although chances are, most of their own eventual experiences probably wouldn't involve a creepy older college guy, played by Patrick Muldoon, later to play a similarly creepy jerk in Starship Troopers, seducing a 16-year-old girl whom he's just employed to wait tables. And fortunately, most people's first breakup probably won't be soundtracked by the band Zack Attack butchering How Am I Supposed to Live Without You. But still, this was a major and significant development in the Saved by the Bell canon, showing viewers that they could never take the character's happiness for granted. Number 3. The Fabulous Belding Boys, Season 2, Episode 16. As already mentioned, whenever Saved by the Bell decided to get serious with its issues, the results were almost invariably laughable. But every so often, and we really do mean occasionally, the episodes could make a strong moral point almost in spite of themselves. One such example is this second season episode, in which the Bayciders are introduced to Mr. Belding's younger, hipper, long-haired brother, Rod Belding. Brought in as a substitute teacher, Rod is the absolute antithesis of their oft-mocked principal, giving them all the grades they want, encouraging them to use his first name and upgrading their senior class trip to a whitewater rafting expedition. But of course, he ultimately turns out to be an absolute tool, ditching the kid's dream trip for a dirty weekend with an air hostess, and it's left to the better Belding to heroically step in and accompany the kids instead. In its message that the sort of teacher, or parent, or authority figure in general, that school kids want is rarely the one that's best for them, the episode makes a striking and mature point, and in giving depth to the relationship between good old Richard Belding and his ability to put the kids first, it's almost, dare we say it, a bit moving. Number 2. Fake IDs, Season 3, Episode 9. For a show that's a great sitcom, it's fair to say that a lot of the laughs in Saved by the Bell made you realize how you looked at 90s situations as a kid. After looking at Saved by the Bell as an adult you see how some things were funny in the 90s and might still be nowadays. But just as it could occasionally pull off serious, see entry number 1, it continued to show you why it was a record-breaking sitcom. Cut Day managed it, and so did this fellow third season classic, which is well constructed around a solid premise, and genuinely funny. Zack meets and falls for a college student at the max, so obviously, the natural course of action is to get Screech to make fake IDs for the guys, so that they can hang out with her at the over-18 club The Attic. Zack made sure he was going to get this girl. From setup, to a carefully managed scheme, to unraveling involving Zack's mother, this all plays out in an obvious but fun way. And the ridiculousness of the nightclub scenes themselves can be countered by the fact that it's actually a pretty zinging comedy episode. With a lot of laughs and a big surprise at the end. Tied for number 1. Rockumentary, Season 3, Episode 22. There are a number of Bell episodes that could be described as 90s funny. From the one where they all sing a song for Slater's dead pet lizard, to the infamous Jesse's song, you could compile an entire top 10 list of the show's most 90s humor moments. And even then, the same episode would probably top the list as does this one, Rockumentary, a well-thought great 25 minutes which sees Casey Kasem, yep, him again, introducing a behind-the-music-style documentary on Zack Attack. Wait, what? Yes, it seems that Zack's band, first glimpsed in The Last Dance, have suddenly become the primary concern in the lives of the Bayside chums, except for Jesse, due to the fact that, According to Dustin Diamond's book, Elizabeth Berkeley split her knee open shortly before filming, and this episode charts their rise from garage band teenagers to global rock megastars. It doesn't take long for an increasingly self-obsessed Zack to drive away the rest of the band, and then Lisa becomes a gladiator, and Slater crashes his motorbike, and lots of other funny stuff happened. 
Of course, it all turns out to be a dream, but it has a surprising amount of fun getting to that point, with a sense that the writers at this point really had a good time stretching the boundaries and thinking outside the box for this episode. Perhaps the most interesting thing about the episode, of course, is that it seems to serve as a template for producer Peter Engel's next hit show, California Dreams, which hit the networks barely a year after Rockumentary was broadcast. The two shows even seem to share a garage set. But did the Dreams ever have a song as good as Zach's, Friends Forever? We think not. Tied for number one. Jesse's song aka I'm So Excited, ninth episode of season two. Saved by the Bell straight-A student Jesse Spano, whose caffeine pill addiction was at the center of Jesse's song. Originally they were going to make Jesse addicted to the drug speed, but due to the network, they changed it to caffeine pills instead. The overachiever was under a tremendous amount of pressure to succeed and used the extra energy from the supplements to help her manage her school workload and the responsibilities of her new singing group, Hot Sunday. Eventually, an exhausted Jesse breaks down in front of her best friend Zach Morris, Mark Paul Gosseler, when he arrives to take her to a talent competition, but ends up confronting her about her addiction. I'm so excited, I'm so excited, she sings, before breaking into tears. I'm so scared. She cries as Zach comforts her and tells her that they're going to get through this. For three decades, Jesse's dramatic meltdown while singing the Pointer Sisters I'm So Excited has been both revered and joked. Berkeley Lauren aka Jesse gets it. She laughs at the memes too. Still, she hopes that people don't miss the real message of the episode. I hope you enjoyed our top 10 Saved by the Bell episodes. Please leave a comment below for any episode you think we missed or you think should have been placed. Don't forget to subscribe. And new episodes come out every Monday through Friday.